the subtitle of this series is The Birth of the Early Church. And if you've ever sat in a circle full of women and moms sharing birth accounts, what you know is though the function of birth and giving birth is very common, there are no two birth accounts that are the same. That is even the case among my four children with the same body giving birth. And so also, this will be the case we'll see with the birth of the early church. The churches will have unique and auspicious beginnings, every one of them individually, and we are going to have the privilege of seeing how many of the early churches were birthed and under the circumstances in which they came about being. So turn with me to Acts chapter 6, and we are going to see right off the bat some of these accounts. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, which were Greek-speaking Jews, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, these are really what we would know today as deacons. We are seeing the birth of some of the offices within the church, okay? And what happens is you have Peter and some of the apostles who are going about filled with the Spirit, called to preach, called to teach, called to devote themselves to prayer. But there are some things that are not getting done within this early church setting. And so when the Hellenists, the, uh, the Hellenistic Jews, who are the uh, Greek-speaking Jews, bring this to their attention, they agree there is something that needs to be done about that. And that is how we see the office of deacon is born, to be serving the church, okay? Now, I think it's interesting that there's two things I would want to point out here. The first is this was not a lesser task. This was something that all agreed needed to be addressed. So it wasn't that this is not important. It was that it was not the calling that Peter and the apostles had on them. And so we see, again, this picture of a body of Christ. You know, the, the church is often referred to as a body. Well, within a body, we have different functions. And so that's kind of what you see being parsed out here among these early church members is that there are some that are going to be in this role of preaching and praying and teaching and some that need to be serving. And so they find men that are a good report, full of faith. The other thing that I see, and I think this is important, and ladies, you will relate to this if you've ever been on a committee or you've ever been in a social organization or maybe even within a class in church. You know, there's always people that are uh, gifted, is that how we would say it? Gifted at finding the holes in the organization. <laughs> and I love that apparently not only are the Hellenistic Jews the, one that, the ones that bring this up, but we can tell by the names of the people that respond to this, they are also the ones that fill that void, okay? And I think that's kind of an important principle that we see taking place. The willingness to, I'm going to bring this up, but I'm also going to be willing to hop in there and solve this. This problem, okay? Now, in this next section, uh, commentator John Whitaker says, we are going to see that it lays the theological foundation to move beyond Jerusalem into Judea, Judea, into Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. You might remember on session one, we acknowledge that we today are sitting basically at the ends of the earth from what they would have known at that time. And so we are going to see that as we move forward, we are going to 
move past Jerusalem, this first church, often referred to as the mother church. That's where we see these, this setting that has already taken place. And now we are going to see the church is on the move. Okay, so pick up with me in verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of them who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I read one commentary that described it as innocence and uh, composed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you've kind of got some problems right off the bat. As this church is on the move and as Stephen, who is full of faith, is taking the word, the gospel, into other places, he is immediately met with opposition. And that is something we, if you have studied with us at all, you have heard me say repeatedly, the gospel has enemies. Point and case. These people were bringing false allegations. They were doing everything they could to stop the spread of the gospel. But I want to tell you something. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, and we will see that that will be the case as we continue to study. But let's be clear. Stephen was not an apostle. You might, you might remember that. So this is the first time that signs and wonders are going to be separated from the apostolic ministry, okay? Now, some would argue that he has been charged by the apostles when he had the hands that were laid upon him in his role as deacon. So there's perhaps that. But this is also just something that we kind of have to hold in tension. So, so it's not necessarily normative, but it is something that we see going on here, that he is going to provide some signs and wonders. The, the Holy Spirit, Spirit is going to choose to use him in ways that were akin to those of the apostles. And listen, if we're noting that today, thousands of years later, I want to tell you they for sure noted that back then, okay? He was very much in, in their eye and in their view, and they were looking to take him down, and we see very clearly they did everything they could to do so, okay? So, so the Holy Spirit is moving through him, and he is now uh, has drawn the attention and the ire of those in the temple, okay? And this is not a good place to be. And as you probably already know, this is not going to end well for him, okay? Now, I do want to point out something. It's very important that we keep timelines. You know, as you read through the accounts in Scripture, what you're going to see is it seems like maybe we're three days in. This is probably three years in to the birth of the church and everything. So we aren't, these things are not happening overnight. Likely Stephen has grown into this ministry. He has grown into this knowledge of God and this working through the Holy Spirit. And so he is definitely standing out to these people. Now it's interesting because you might remember that when Peter and John were described, and they of course are apostles and they were doing similar signs and wonders, they are described as uneducated, and untrained, okay? So that's what kind of stood out about them. That is not what we see about Stephen. You might have noticed that they were unable to withstand his wisdom. So we see that Stephen is likely an educated, uh, very sharp uh, debater, if you will, to go, to go against these people because they had to resort, rather than going toe to toe with him intellectually, they have to resort to lying and false accusations against him because they are not able to hold their own with him intellectually, okay? So we will see that the priest will confront Stephen and then 
Stephen is going to have the longest recorded speech in all of the New Testament. We will see from verses 7 to 52 that Stephen is going to uh, lay the groundwork for the gospel to go forward here. Now, we don't have time, of course, to read the entire speech. You will be reading this a few times this week in your study, in your time of personal study, and I, don't skip it. I would encourage you to lean into that. You know, there's just something that happens in the course of repetitive reading. The Lord just uses that to sear it on your heart. But here's a few things that I'm, I would just encourage you to frame your personal study with. Just some things about this speech that we're going to see Stephen give, okay? The first one is that Stephen knows Israel's history, okay? Remember, he is accused of being blasphemous and saying things against Moses and against God, and he's going to set out, and he is going to go through the timeline of the Bible. He is going to very firmly establish that he knows the God of the Bible. He knows the history of his people, and he is not seeking to twist or change what has been known throughout all of their history and what their spiritual foundation has been based upon, okay? So he's gonna clearly combat these false teaching arguments by, by recounting the truth of scripture as it was known to that point, okay? And I love how Stephen takes time to trace this history. You know, one of the things that we always do in our book studies is that we walk in to the book and this is kind of what we see Stephen employing, this idea of we are going to get our bearings. We are going to walk through where we have been and how we got here. And that's what you see Stephen stand before the priest and to these people in this council and do. He is going to walk through the history of God, the history of his people. He's going to establish who Moses was and who Abraham was and who the um, patriarchs were. He is going to let them know, don't worry, I know what I'm talking about, okay? The second thing that I think it's important for us to note as you spend some time in personal study during this passage this week is that Stephen does not play it safe. He does not play it safe. Make no mistake, he has bested these Pharisees, okay? He has proven that he is intellectually and spiritually equivalent to them by recounting what he knows about the Old Testament, but he does not pedal softly around their culpability in, um, in crucifying Christ. Okay, pick up with me in verse 51. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. He did not water down his message to those people. And so it will not surprise you in light of what we just read that the next caption in most of your Bibles is going to say the stoning of Stephen, right? This enraged them. It enraged them. And so, um, so he had to have known that. Somebody as smart as he was, who understood the culture, understood the times, he knew what he was doing, and he did not soft pedal or shrink back from the truth of the gospel and calling out their sin, okay? The third thing that I think it's important for us to see in framing this speech that Stephen gives before these priests and these council members is that Stephen has connected the dots. Do you wonder what would make a person willing to face that type of persecution and almost certain martyrdom? Stephen has made the connection between the God of Israel, the God of his history, the God that his whole people have based their faith on, and he has made that to the point of the Messiah whom God sent in Christ, okay? There's no question in his mind that he is allegiant to Christ, who is the Messiah, who is the resurrected one, and he can articulate his faith, and it's real to him. It is just as real to him as the men standing before him who are about to take his life, okay? You know, Peter will later say in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the, the Lord as holy, always being prepared 
to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. You almost have to wonder, did Peter have Stephen in mind when he penned those words? I mean, because we are seeing this play out right here in scriptures. So let's see how this story ends for Stephen. Pick up with me in verse 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Man, what a way to go. Right in the footsteps of Jesus, with the words of Jesus on his lips from the most central act of salvation in all of history. You know, we see references throughout scripture that uh, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. That's not what we see right here. Did y'all notice that? We see that Jesus, when Stephen sees him, when his spirit is about to be committed to him in heaven, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. We see that twice. I don't think that's, that's accidental, ladies. He is standing. What kind of faith would make Jesus stand as someone is ushered into heaven. The kind of faith that Stephen showed, the kind of faith that knows with certainty that there is a Messiah, that there is a life beyond, and that the people need to hear this. Notice he did not go into this next heavenly realm angry and bitter. He did not go piously saying, you'll see one day, don't you worry, you'll get yours. That's not, the, that's not the posture in which we see Stephen accepting this unfair fate. No, we see him knowing his Christ so intimately that the words of Christ are on his lips as he is facing the very end, the same ones that Jesus himself was calling out on behalf of the people. That's the kind of faith that we see Stephen exhibit, the kind of faith that makes Jesus stand at the right hand of God and welcome him into heaven. Ladies, as we study this week, as we go through and, and dive into the scriptures and dive into the account of Stephen, I want you to know that that same God is the same God that we serve. We can have that same relationship with Christ that gives us the boldness, that gives us the confidence to face whatever opposition it is that we might face in life, whether that even be unto death. And we can say, I am so assured in my faith that I know the minute that something happens here, the minute my spirit leaves me on earth, I am going to be with Jesus, with God. And man, I'd love to see God stand, Jesus standing when I go. I, I don't know that that will happen, but wow, what a faith to aspire to. So this week, as you spend some time digging into scripture, I want to tell you there are some gems to be found. There is a faith that we can cling to. So ladies, as you study, dig deep, study hard, because it's worth it.